Hello, I'm uh, George Gilbert, lecturer in Modern Russian History at the University of Southampton. Um, and the third of these series of clips I want to record today is about the 1905 revolution. So I've said a little bit about some of the longer term changes occurring in the late imperial period. I've said a little bit about social and economic change, a bit about political opposition, both of which I think are really important to explain what's to come. But I do think 1905 needs its own short clip. Now, the 1905 revolution is an enormously complicated event in its own right. It might be worth saying at the outset that what in fact we call the 1905 revolution is perhaps maybe more of a period. We see an increasing um, amount of unrest in the country at large from 1904 onwards, both in a political and social vein. And this is something that really occurs well into 1906 and indeed into the earliest years of 1907, when the autocracy runs to totally restore its authority. Most of the major agitational changes occur in the year 1905 itself, but historians have been quite quick to point out, in fact, we see a period, really, of unrest from three, from three to four years, rather than just one year. So, thinking then about why 1905 occurs then, well, there are many re different reasons why you might say it occurs. Um, some of these are longer-term causes. Things like economic dis discontent, rural poverty, urbanisation and rise of a more militant working class, and also ideologies and their in, in, impact in Russia. The in, impact of ideas like Marxism, movements like the terrorist movement, and also anti-autocratic ideas more widely. The question of liberalism, of course, is an important one that I mentioned in the last series of recordings. On the other hand, you've got short-term causes playing an increasingly important role. Father Capon and the Winter Palace is one instance of this. Um, in January 1905, um, the marching on the Winter Palace by Father Capon and loyal protesters um, is known as, well, what occurs is known as Bloody Sunday. He delivers a manifesto a con uh, agitating for change, which you can see actually, it's been translated and is available on the internet, um, with a series of workers' demands. Police and troops open fire. Um, in the massacre that follows, um, it's said that popular confidence in the Tsar is rocked. Um, this becomes known as Bloody Sunday, and it's an event that the revolutionary movement throughout 1905 refers to as a kind of progenitor, the most important event of that kind of particular era. It's a short-term trigger, trigger factor. Occurring over the year, then, we've got the Russo-Japanese War. Um, Nicholas II um, was one of several leading figures in Russia who thought it'd be a short, victorious war. Um, and in fact, all of these uh, predictions of short, short uh, vict victorious conflict and military supremacy are rapidly shown to be um, the complete antithesis of the actual situation. Russia does not do well in the Russo-Japanese War. It suffers a series of disastrous reverses. Um, uh, and the Kind of the failure of this war shakes a lot of um, Russian conservatives and people are actually quite supportive of the Tsar. Another short-term cause is the failure of the Liberals' campaign. I talked about the different types of opposition in the last clip, the Liberals on the one hand and revolutionists on the other. Well, the gradualist solution, you might say, what was seen in it late, late 1904 with the Banquet campaign, was perhaps maybe not uh, making any inroads that some of its supporters wished it to. And that leads some to maybe question perhaps maybe whether a more radical solution is needed to the problems of uh, Russian society and Russian life. Nineteen oh five itself is an enormously important and a complicated year. We see many important effects occur which will have great political ramifications uh, in Russia in that year and indeed for later on too. We see the formation of the Union of Liberation, the so-called Constitutional Democrat Party, known as the Cadet Party. This would become the leading liberal faction and indeed liberal leading faction of any sort in the first Russian state Duma parliament that appears after the 1905 revolution. We see the formation of the Soviets, local councils during 1905. Leon Trotsky is one of a number of important figures who plays a key role in these. We also see throughout the year um, political mobilisation and the coalescing of discontent in Russia it becomes extremely important during that year and indeed occurs throughout the year and indeed afterwards too. We see the rise of professional identities, um, the mobilisation of workers and peasants and also the resurgence of the strike movement culminating in the general strike of October of 1905. 
What's really important to realise about 1905 is it's actually a mass social revolution and resistance and opposition comes not just from political classes in society but indeed from society much more widely. It's an enormous movement for social change. Professional identities play an important role but so do many many workers and many peasants. It indeed involves millions of people across the Russian Empire in 1905 and indeed after too. During this year it becomes the case that throughout many of Russia's major towns and cities and indeed in the countryside it's clear that authority in its traditional sense cannot be cannot be kept by the Russian the Russian Russia's rulers. So what instead occurs is we have a series of conflict throughout Russia but it's clear that this conflict is not going to be an answer to many of these important and pressing issues. In fact, something different needs to occur. Russia's rulers and indeed many of Russia's leading bureaucrats and political ministers look for solutions to some of these problems. Throughout the year and indeed later on into the year, Sergei Vito is one of these leading figures, the Prime Minister. He's one of the leading figures behind what becomes known as the October Manifesto, seen on 17th of October of 1905. This is a very important document. It promises far-reaching civil rights, rights of religious association, rights of political association, although it does indeed have clear limits. It in fact keeps the autocracy, it keeps Tsarism as an institution, and of course the Tsar himself, Nicholas II, is still installed. So you can, you can maybe push it too far in terms of how far-reaching its change will be, but nothing quite like it has been seen before in Russia, not even in the brief moment of constitutionalism towards the end of the 1870s. What it indeed leads to is constitutionalism in Russia at the end of 1905 and in the years to come. As the revolutionary movement starts to dissipate, we see the Russian uh, state follow a dual process of reform and repression. So on the one hand you have reform of constitutional Russia, the, create, the state council stays, the so-called upper house, but also the lower house too, the politics and parliament appear in the parliament, the so-called Duma, D-U-M-A. There's also now a constitution in, in Russia, so we have a constitutionalism in the country, although Article 87 places clear limits on all of these constitutional designs. At the same time, it would be fair to say that there's still enormous amounts of repression going on throughout the Russian countryside. Uh, the strategy is, is twofold. On the one hand, it's reform to emoliate opponents and instigate much needed political change, but also there's repression to eliminate opponents. Stolypin's necktie, the so-called mobile gallows, leads to thousands of deaths across the country as the revolutionary movement is harshly persecuted. It's also worth thinking about political repression too. The fundamental laws mean that the Duma itself is still fundamentally at the whims of the autocrat, i.e. the person of the Tsar, Nicholas II. So, although things on the face of it might have changed enormously, the autocracy still holds untrammeled political power. I've mentioned Sergei Vita, Russia's first Prime Minister, a few times. It might be worth just dwelling briefly on his successor, Petr Stolypin. He plays an enormously important role in Russian history. Um, Petr Stolypin has very far-reaching plans for agricultural change, the so-called rage on the strong, and the potential dissolution even of an important social unit in Russia, the peasant commune, the Mir. New electoral law laws in 1907 attempt to create what he considers a more loyal Duma. The first and the second state Dumas are dissolved in 1906 and 1907 respectively. They're indeed full of Russia's Russian autocracy's political opponents. Liberals and indeed the soft left dominate these two houses. The third, the third Duma is created in the eyes of Petr Stolypin to be more, in his terms, Russian in spirit. Indeed, it's far more overall conservative and nationalist when you look at the political party deputies that dominate the third and indeed fourth Dumas. The Constitutional Democrats, the Duma, the cadets, they play a very important role in the first and second Dumas. And indeed they do in the third and the fourth too, but the overall dominance of the house is gradually sidelined because of these changes made by Russia's rulers. So 1905 led to enormous change. It was a moment of great social protest, a moment of great uprising, and what it leads to is a kind of a, a constitutional settlement in Russia, but an uneasy balance between, on the one hand, the liberal opposition of Russia, and indeed the conservatives who still control many of Russia's leading ministries. 
The revolutionary movement has been temporarily sidelined, but of course it will play an enormously important role in years to come. And indeed, many of these questions of political rights, these questions of social change have not gone away. Indeed, they'll play an enormously important role in Russia in the years leading up to the First World War and indeed in the war years itself.